morning. Um, I just want to say happy World AIDS Day before we go on and talk about anything else. Um, this has been a, uh, an issue that affects me where I work in Lake Tanganyika, um, but it affects everybody all around the world. So I think we should take a moment to <clears throat> say that. Um, so my talk is called How to Sail in the Wilderness, and it I think will become clear why it is titled that. Um, this is sunrise on Lake Tanganyika uh, on the Congo side of the lake. Um, my team and I are doing a, a sunrise distribution of bed nets to prevent malaria. Uh, lake Tanganyika is the longest lake in the world. There are almost 2,000 kilometers of coastline around the lake. Um, it's a vast, vast place in a very, very remote location. Uh, Tanganyika, this lake um, is called the Mother Lake by many researchers who work there because this is the oldest, deepest lake in Africa. Um, but in Swahili, it literally means sailing in the wilderness or in the unknown. And this is an incredibly uh, apropos name for such a place uh, as I think you will come to see. If there is anything that I can do, I think during this talk, it's I want to leave you with the idea that this body of water that almost no one knows anything about is an incredibly strategic and important place, um, not just from a perspective of humanitarianism or environmentalism or geopolitics, but in fact, all of these things uh, imposed on one another. Um, one of the things about Lake Tanganyika is that it holds 17% of the world's fresh water. Um, that's a lot of water. And to put that into perspective, uh, only 2.5% of the water on the planet is sweet, as you say here in Holland, or fresh, as we say in other English-speaking countries. Um, and of that 2.5%, less than 1% of that fresh water is actually available for, for use for all of the ways in which we need fresh water. Um, and uh, something that is becoming a much more prominent discussion in policy circles is more so than oil or gas. Um, in the next 20 to 50 years, people believe that water security will be one of the defining features in, in geostability. And here, we have 17% of it. And to again, put that in perspective of all of the five great lakes in North America, uh, this is almost as much of, as all of those combined. The other thing about Lake Tanganyika is that it is one of uh, the most diverse uh, aquatic ecosystems on the planet. There are about 1,600 species present in the Lake Tanganyika Basin, and over half of them are totally unique to Lake Tanganyika. Um, this is a cichlid, uh, of which there are more than 250 species, um, and it's by studying these fish that uh, incredibly elegant um, research uh, has shown how evolution takes place, microevolution. In addition to aquatic life, there is a lot of unique terrestrial life, wetlands. This is really a very, very unique place on the planet in terms of biodiversity and environmentalism. The other thing about this place is that it's experienced about 20 years of, of war and, and civil conflict. Um, 13 million people live in the Lake Tanganyika Basin, and a vast majority of those people in some way or another were affected by what has transpired in the Great Lakes Basin for the past uh, almost 20 years that began with the Rwandan genocide and civil war in Burundi and, and devolved into the two Congo wars. This is a very, very complex story, 
But suffice to say, um, this has been a theater of, of real human suffering uh, for a long time. Uh, the, the other thing I want to say is that in addition to the civil unrest and stability, the, the region really suffers from some of the worst socioeconomic indicators in sub-Saharan Africa and on the planet. One of them is that a quarter of all children under five die. Um, that's, to me, a shocking fact. If that fact happened here in Amsterdam or New York City or Chicago, where I'm originally from, like, society would cease to exist as we know it. Um, but here, it's par for the course. Um, because this is a conference given by women and about women, I wanted to give another statistic about the risk of being a woman in the Lake Tanganyika Basin. And so one of those is that the lifetime risk of pregnancy, and here is a comparison to the United States, is one in 31. So aside from uh, gender-based violence that we read about and war and uh, other kinds of unrest, right, just by being a woman, you, your life is in danger. Um, and also just to point out the, the figure in the United States with all of the money that we spend on healthcare in the United States, our, our, our number is way worse than yours. <laughs> so, um, the other thing I wanna say about this number though of, of, of this risk in pregnancy is there are women who die in pregnancy, but of every woman who dies in pregnancy, 20 more will be injured um, develop a disease or become somehow disabled from pregnancy. And so this is one of my patients, Susanna, who developed a pregnancy-related injury. She developed an obstetric fistula. And we just repaired her after she suffered from the fistula for three years. This is just a diagram to show it's old, but all the progress that has been made since 2005 has not taken place in Sub-Saharan Africa. So where it's red, it's still red. Um, so who else is in the Lake Tanganyika Basin? Uh, I, I chose this picture because many people have heard of Jane Goodall, who um, has been working with chimpanzees for 20 years. Well, she's working with chimpanzees in the Lake Tanganyika Basin. Uh, she's on the Tanzanian side. Uh, and her organization, the Jane Goodall Institute, has done some really phenomenal work over the years. Um, the UN is present, uh, some multilateral presence is there, a small number of NGOs with whom we try to collaborate and work are there, but I'll tell you, the real players in the Lake Tanganyika Basin are the following. China. Um, uh, China has an incredibly strong presence all across sub-Saharan Africa, and they do in the Lake Tanganyika Basin in particular. Uh, China is a complicated and enormous country, but suffice to say that as, as a nation, it is a resource-hungry um, place, and we're talking about timber, industrial minerals, but also food and especially water. China is one of the most water-starved nations on the planet. And again, going back to the fact that 17% of the world's fresh water is in this place, that should give people a little, a little pause. What should also give people a little bit of pause is there's an off-sided statistic that 16 of the 20 most polluted places on the planet are in China. So as stewards of environmental places, I don't think the Chinese necessarily have a great record. Um, the other people that are present, this is not working. Can you advance? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, 
the extractors. The extractors are the other, you know, big guys in the neighborhood. Um, and not just gold, um, but all kinds of industrial minerals, as well as oil and gas. Um, can you advance? So here, I just want to show a brief map of, of, this is Eastern Congo. This is Lake Tanganyika. These show some of the different kinds of mines that are present there. Um, but this is not an exhaustive map. Um, advance, please. This shows some of the oil and gas blocks. Um, here you see the four blocks in Burundi. Um, all right, I'm going to go on. There are several oil blocks in, on the Congo side. There are two very large oil blocks on the Tanzanian side. Um, and then there are these four blocks in Burundi. And we do know, right, that these blocks um, have gone out for bid and that there are certain companies, many of them European, um, as well as Australian, who are beginning to uh, do their work there. Um, the other people and entities are rebel groups, arms smugglers, conflict mineral exporters, and poachers. Um, so this is a kind of, um, this is a difficult place to work. <laughs> um, can you advance, please? So I, I'm hoping that it, by this point, you all agree with me that there is a lot at stake in the Lake Tanganyika Basin from many different perspectives, regardless of what your philanthropic or humanitarian hot button might be, whether you're an environmentalist or you care about refugee rights or you're interested in global health or you're interested in conflict minerals or, and human slavery. This is a place that really has all of those things. Um, and with a population that's growing at the lowest possible common denominator of society, where existence is really desperate, um, we really are, I believe, sitting on a bit of a time bomb. Um, and although I don't like to think of myself as a Cassandra, per se, uh, I've been willing to take this role in the Lake Tanganyika Basin. Um, can you advance? So because of the lack of infrastructure in this place, I really see this, I see the solutions as being a way of melding all of, all of these issues together. Can you advance? So that in order to begin to solve some of these problems, you have to, can you go again? you have to find the core of, of all of these issues and where they overlap together. Can you advance? So uh, this is how we sail in the wilderness on Lake Tanganyika. I see most of these problems as being a supply chain problem. And not just a supply chain problem in terms of goods and services, but in terms of also ideas. Can you advance? Um, so we want to sail in the wilderness in a boat. Um, I think actually that's the most appropriate way of sailing in the wilderness in this place. Um, advance. Go ahead. So this shows um, a, a blueprint for what my organization is trying to do. Thanks. Um, we're trying to build a hospital on a ship that goes up and down Lake Tanganyika. Uh, and why just a hospital and not all these other things? Well, all these other things are intrinsically tied up in the project that we, that we do. In order to build a hospital on a landlocked lake in Central Africa, you have to solve a lot of these kinds of issues and you have to work with groups that work in, in these sectors. And, and that's what we do. Um, so I think change is coming to the Lake Tanganyika Basin. And the question is, how will this change manifest? And will these communities that live around Lake Tanganyika be empowered, actually, to 
be able to participate in, in making choices about the world that they come from. Um, but the other thing that you need to sail in the wilderness is a map, okay? And there's something that the extractors and the Chinese don't have, which is our map. And I was asked by many people, can you reveal something about yourself that no one knows? And so I decided, well, where can I do that except in a room full of women in Amsterdam? Which is to say <laughs> that before I became a doctor and went to business school and did, you know, lived my life the way I live it now, many years ago I worked as an exotic dancer. <laughs> and so in the immortal words of James Brown, the great soul musician, you've got to use what you've got to get what you want. And so with that, I'm going to show you our special map. It involves a striptease. Ready? 